Yeah, there is some seats up there. Um, hopefully, uh, you can still see and hear everybody. Um, welcome, and thank you for making the trip on this wonderful autumn day. Today's Politics in a Pint is brought to, you, brought to you by Eugene J. McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement. My name is Alex Ritchie. I'm a student volunteer for the McCarthy Center, and uh, one of my roles is to help coordinate this series of events. Um, the event today is a formal debate between the candidates running for state representative in District 14B. Uh, the two participants this afternoon are DFL incumbent Mr. Larry Hosh and Republican challenger Mr. Tom Hellenbecker. Moderating this discussion today is our very own Professor Matt Lindstrom, uh, and he's also the director of the McCarthy Center. Uh, if you want to get involved with the McCarthy Center, please feel free to talk to any of our workers or stop by our uh, facility. It's in Simons 136. Um, so, on that note, I turn over to Matt uh, to tell you the details of the debate. Um, and I would like to thank you guys for your respectful participation today. So, uh, take it away, Matt. Well, thanks, uh, everyone, for showing up. This is a great turnout. We're excited to have everyone here, and we want to thank the two candidates as well. Um, this will be about an hour, hour, 15 minutes. Kind of depends on your involvement, your questions, which we'll get to uh, in about 30 or so minutes. Uh, let me just kind of go quickly over the format. Um, first of all, uh, coin flip determined who's going to give the introductory talk and uh, the introductory remarks. And so Tom won the coin flip. He brought a really cool coin from the St. Joe American Legion. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, but but a little bit on the format. We're gonna uh, we're gonna rotate the questions. So one candidate, candidate A, will get the first question. They'll have two minutes uh, to respond. We do have a timekeeper in front. And, uh, and then the other candidate will get three minutes to respond. And then, same question, candidate A will get one minute. So, total about six, five or six minutes for each question. However, candidates do not have to use all their time either. Um, I would like to ask you not to clap until the very end. Deal? Yeah. Deal. Yeah. And then, well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, they're going to want to clap. This is a great group here. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a safe crowd. Yeah. Um, the, uh, there, like, as I mentioned, there will be uh, plenty of time for your questions. So you know, maybe jot, get a pen out or whatever. You want to jot down some, some thoughts, some questions, and uh, we'll get to those soon. When we do have the student or the audience questions, each candidate will get two minutes to respond to that particular question. Uh, if they so choose. So with that, um, our timekeeper is ready. And uh, candidates, we do have a 30 second sign as you see right in front. Um, very high tech um, um, sign there. So thanks um, thanks again for all, to all of you for showing up. And thanks for our candidates. So Tom, please. Uh, again. OK, well, thank you, Matt. And uh, I'd also like to thank the McCarthy Center for sponsoring this debate. And it's a great turnout. I, actually, I think this is probably the largest crowd that we've had at any of our forums. So I uh, really appreciate you guys coming out here and uh, being very interested in what's going on in our district. And uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you to uh, House District 14B as well. I'm sure a lot of you don't, uh, aren't from the St. Joseph area or, or uh, just moved here from different parts of the states or even different parts of the country. So again, welcome to, uh, welcome to the St. Joseph area. I'm a 50-year uh, fourth generation resident of Stearns County. Uh, this is my first run for office. I'm, I'm certainly not a professional politician. What I've uh, done is I, I just saw how the state has been uh, uh, going over the last uh, eight or 10 years. And I thought, you know, it's a, I, I, I've talked talk for long enough. It's about time I got involved on a, on a, on a little bit more of a, of a basis where I actually decided I'd run for office as well. So. Uh, again, uh, a little bit of my background. I'm a uh, small business owner. I own a couple of businesses in Saint, uh, one in St. Cloud, and uh, I run one out of my house uh, as a manufacturer's rep. Uh, manufacturer's rep in business uh, brings uh, manufacturers into the uh, wind industry, so I'm very involved in the wind industry in, in the United States. And um, the other business I own is a restaurant out at Crossroads, so if you ever make it out to Crossroads, just stop in at Baja Joe's and uh, visit my kids. Uh, I've got uh, four kids who work there. Uh, that's what happens in this, in this economy. You know, your kids are looking for jobs, and one way you can do that is you can open up a business and you can, and you can hire your family. And I'm sure that's what you guys are looking forward to as well, is that hopefully that the uh, Minnesota economy will turn itself around so when you guys graduate in the next year or two, that uh, the jobs will be out there for you as well. So you don't have to move back home with mom and dad. So, thank you. 
There. Well, it's uh, great to be here back on the old stopping grounds that I spent um, probably the best four years of my life with. Um, I was a St. John's grad. I graduated in the year 2000. Um, I live in St. Joseph with my family. I have a three-year-old son at home, and I have a two-week-old. That uh, so I'm a, a new two, uh, a new fa father of two children, and, and that's a different experience. Um, but I just want to give you a little bit of background about how I got here today, because this isn't uh, something that I ever envisioned myself to be in the elected office. I came to St. John's here in 1996. I majored in social work. Uh, my goal was to, to work uh, mainly with people um, with disabilities and people living in poverty. I graduated in the year 2000, just had my 10-year reunion. Um, but um, I never took a single political science class um, in my four years here. Um, when I was going to college, I was working my way to pay my way through college, and one of those jobs was at Sal's. And while I was working there, um, I started getting involved into some issues with the city because I knew I wanted to make St. Joseph my, my home. I fell in love with the local girl. Um, St. Joseph was a place I fell in love with, and I wanted to make this my home. And I got involved in some issues dealing with um, rental housing. And at that time, the mayor of St. Joseph said that I was a college student, I worked at a bar, and my opinion didn't matter. And that frustrated me. Um, because it shouldn't matter if we're 18 or 20 or 50 years old when it comes to our ability to have a voice heard regardless of where we live and where we go to school or whatnot. So one night after um, finishing up work at the local establishment, I decided that I'm going to run for mayor. And lo and behold, I got elected mayor the year that I graduated. And I quickly found out that I loved trying to work on issues to bring people together that oftentimes had opposing viewpoints and looking towards solutions. Um, so I, I was elected mayor, I'm, I'm now your state representative, I get to work on a lot of the issues um, that brought me here in the first place, um, that brought me here to be a social work major. And I hope we get a chance to talk about those issues today. Thank you for being here, thank you for your interest. I'd like to say that you're here to see um, Tom and myself, but I know you're here for the pizza also. And I hope you enjoy the, the next hour of that. Hey Tom, first question. Um, you know, both of you are actually St. John's grads. And uh, I guess I'd like to have you tell us a little bit about how your education here has influenced your character, has influenced your values, especially those that you bring to the vision, your vision for government in Minnesota. Well, uh, very, very good question. That's one question that we haven't had. That's, uh, that's great. Uh, yes, I did go to St. John's. It was back before uh, I think any of you were born. It was uh, 1976 and 1980. So, so I'm a Johnny as well. Uh, as far as influencing uh, my, when I, when I started at St. John's as a freshman, I would probably uh, consider myself a pretty liberal person. And through my years uh, of going to St. John's, through the four years, actually I, uh, I became more conservative as the years went by. So I, I do kind of uh, uh, use, use the St. John's as being that, that type of an influence on me. Uh, especially in the areas of, of, of being pro-life and, and realizing the importance of family and, and that kind of stuff, because it is a it is a great close close knit Catholic community, and uh, I did go to a Catholic high school, but I think I had kind of uh, fallen away a little bit on my uh, on, you know through high school on, on my faith and, and attending uh, church and that kind of stuff. So when I started attending St. John's, I kind of got back in touch with that, and I, and I hope you guys can take advantage of that as well uh, in your in your time out here at St. John's, because it really has been an important part of my life. And it has carried on into, like I said, I'm, I'm 52 years old now. I, I uh, live in St. Joe. I, I belong to the, uh, the St. Joseph's Church, uh, the Church of St. Joseph in St. Joe. So I've continued on with the, with the uh, influences that the, uh, the, that the Catholic institution gave to me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Larry, uh, same question. Uh, tell us a little bit about how your education here has influenced your character and the values that you bring to the vision for government. And you have uh, three minutes. Well. Uh, that, that, that's a wonderful question. I'm glad I get a chance to answer it. I, I went to my grade, majority of my grade school and my high school at a Catholic institution, but I never really felt um, um, connected to a community. I grew up in the cities. Um, I grew up in Coon Rapids, which is Tino Grace High School. Um, loved the experiences that I had, but still didn't feel connected to a particular community. When I came to St. John's, the overwhelming sense that you get here is the sense of community, that we are all in this together that um, we are friends. Um, and we're friends because you see your classmates every single day. It's not an institution in which it's 50,000 people going to the school and it's an impersonal 
place. This is a personal place in which we develop community. And St. John's has made me who I am today. Absolutely. I got married on campus here. I go to school at, I go to um, my, my parish at St. John's, just um, down at the parish center. And uh, everything that St. John's has provided me um, has developed me to who I am. My best friends have all come from this, uh, from, from my four years spent here. Uh, my memories on Tommy Three Short Wing and at Bonnie and out at Flint Town, um, the, the, the friendships that I developed and the memories that I had carry through to this day. I know that it probably sounds a long time ago when I graduated 10 years, years ago, uh, but it felt, feels like yesterday that I was on, on these campuses. And uh, you know, the, the values of the J-Book, um, the values that we treat each other with respect, and the values that we make sure that we, we carry through as Johnny's and Benny's, um, that we make sure that we look out for one another, um, and, but we also have a, a sense of personal responsibility in how we, we act is something that um, I think has created me who I am today. And, and I carry that through with um, how I govern my family and how I govern as a state legislator. legislator. Um, I'm 100% I'm pro-life, um, but I also know that um, there's others that aren't as fortunate as us. Um, we are profoundly fortunate to go to an institution like this. And we need to acknowledge that and we need to respect that. And I want to make sure that anybody who wants to have the choice and has the ability and the smarts to attend a place like St. John's has that same opportunity that I have. And those are the values that I try to bring down to St. Paul. And I think those are the values that were instilled in me during my four years here at St. John's and St. Paul's. Tom, uh, you have one minute. I okay. All right, moving on. Larry, this goes to you. You have uh, two minutes. On education, seems a fitting topic. Uh, what improvements would you advocate for education policy, whether that's public schools, whether that's higher education? What improvements would you advocate for education policy as our state representative? And what education ideas or proposals do you oppose? Well, <laughs> when, when you're dealing with this, education is 50% of our state budget. 40% of our state budget goes to K-12 education, the other 10% to higher education. So this is a, a large issue to cover in two minutes. Um, first and foremost, education was, is what's made Minnesota great. We have more Fortune 500 companies in Minnesota per capita than any other state in the nation. And those, those companies are here not because we have the best weather or not because we have the best tax climate, but because we have the best workforce. And that workforce has been developed and matured through our higher education system. So we have to make sure we maintain um, the commitment to education that we have in the last 20, 30, 40 years that we've all benefited from. Um, one thing that I want to see to improve K-12 education is moving to a testing system that doesn't simply take a snapshot in time of how a certain school is performing, but a, a testing system that shows the improvement or the growth of a child. Um, right now, we only test, let's say, in like third grade or seventh grade or 11th grade for certain subjects, um, but we don't see the growth of a child. A child could be technically failing, let's say they're getting 50% in math in seventh grade. On um, the next year, they might be getting 7% in math. Um, in, in, in that area, and they're still technically failing, but they've grown substantially. And we need to have some a, a testing system, longitudinal testing, that measures the growth of the child, because that's going to benefit the school district, the family, and the child, and the teacher much more to see how their policy and how their curriculum is affecting the uh, individual child. Secondly, one thing that I don't want to see us move down is a system in which we move away from the state grant program. The state grant program is something that allows um, greater choice when it comes to picking your institution that you want to go to for higher education. 23% um, of those who choose to go to higher education go to a private institution. And we need to make sure we have a financial aid program that honors that choice and make sure that we are able to make college affordable regardless if you go to a public or a private institution. Tom, uh, three minutes. Okay, uh, first, uh, yes, we, we certainly, as legislatures, we do have to have a, a strong commitment to education. Uh, we have to uh, make sure that K through 12 is funded at the right level. Now, deciding what that level is, you know, that, that can be open for debate. Is, is all the money that we're spending on education being spent, uh, being spent in, a, in, a, in a good manner? You know, are there places where, uh, you know, it, it, it certainly has been proven that just throwing money at education does not solve the problems. I mean, some of the, uh, some of the poorest districts 
in, in Minnesota, you will have some of the best, uh, best students. So it's not a matter of, of just making sure that we keep spending more and more money on education, uh, especially K through 12. But what we have to do is that we have to make sure that, uh, that that commitment is there. And I'd also like to see, uh, you know, we, we haven't really talked about this much this year, but uh, at some type of a voucher system where, where K through 12 students could uh, have a voucher and they would have to be able to take that voucher to, uh, to a private school if, if, if that would be a better choice for them and their parents. So I, I would also, I would favor uh, going to some type of a voucher system or at least some kind of a, you know, a, a modified tax credit system for, for uh, getting students uh, into private education uh, if, if, they're, if that's what their parents desire. And uh, uh, another big thing is as far as the testing part goes, I, I certainly would be willing to uh, get rid of No Child Left Behind. I think it's been a terrible, terrible mistake. I don't think the federal government should have that kind of control over uh, the states as far as education goes. So I would certainly uh, get rid of the No Child Left Behind. And uh, I would, it's not that I would recommend that we get rid of the Department of Education, uh, the U.S. Department of Education, but I would much rather see block grants given to the states and let the states decide how that money is spent on education, rather than doing the top down with this, where the federal government gives you money and then they then they have all these requirements that you that you must do, like no child left behind. So that if you choose not to do that, well then they're going to punish you by not giving you the funds necessary for education. So. I really think it needs to be more of a state and local issue that we that getting the federal government out of it would be a great first step in, in improving our in improving our education. Another thing I'd like to see is that I'd really like to see the education unions get more involved in the actual education of the students rather than in just uh, you know negotiating for the contracts for the teachers. And what I mean by that is that if you go on the Education Minnesota website. And they don't mention anything about students. They, all they talk about is, you know, we, we have to vote for these candidates. We have to do, uh, you know, we have to do all these other things. But none of them have to do with actually uh, getting involved in the students themselves. When I was in the electrical business, what the uh, electrical union did is they actually got involved in the education of the electricians. And I think that's what uh, I think that's what the education unions need to do more. They have to get more involved with the uh, with the actual education of the students. Because we've got great teachers and we've got great people involved in education in Minnesota, we just have to, uh, you know, let let the Minnesota people take care of it. Let these great people step forward and let them. Then we should, uh, you know, be able to rise, raise our graduation rates, and we'd be able to provide that uh, great education for our students. Okay, Larry, you do have one minute to uh, respond. Well, well, first I want to want to say that I don't think we're throwing money at education. Uh, if, you, if you look at the information. Um, just eight years ago, the state of Minnesota paid 87% of K-12 education costs. We now only pay 76% of K-12 education costs. And no, that disparity is being fallen onto local property taxes. And when you're in outstate rural Minnesota, but you don't have the property wealth, like a lot of the other areas of the state, um, it becomes quite burdensome. And then you start having disparities through our K-12 education system. And our state constitution says that we have to have a uniform system of education. I think we've been moving away from that. In higher education, we actually have in our statutes that the state should be participating 66% of the tuition costs um, for an individual going to higher education. Right now, we're under 50%. Um, so we have regressed over the years. And I think that has been to the detriment of affordability in higher education. And as I mentioned before, higher education and accessibility to it translates to jobs because our businesses and our companies want to have a well-educated workforce that they can tap into. All right, thank you. Uh, well, we're going to move on to the economy. The so-called Great Recession officially ended in June 2010. Minnesota's economy is actually in much better shape, or at least better shape, than many other states. But I'd like to actually turn to the audience right now. And I want to ask you to raise your hand if you know someone, either a relative or friend, who was laid off, no fault of their own, in the last three years. Okay. How many of you know either relatives or friends that are still unemployed? Okay. So this, first we'll go to Tom and Larry and then Tom. Um, question is, what, in response to what you saw, what should or could the state of Minnesota do more of or do less of to improve the situations of the family and friends that our audience knows. Well, it is 
if we're talking job creation, the, the, the first thing that we can uh, we don't need them doing is raising taxes because that is that is not going to help in any any way, uh, shape, or form to create jobs in Minnesota. You can't uh, you can't be for jobs and against uh, small business and raising taxes on any of the tax plans that uh, that any of the uh, Democrat or 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 the independent uh, uh, governor candidate is pushing uh, any of those any of those pro uh, plans that uh, propose to raise taxes that are going to be just really hurtful on the small business owners in Minnesota. And the small business owners are the ones who create most of the jobs in Minnesota. So we, raising taxes, to me, is not an option. That's just not something that, that, should, be, that, that should be happening. And, and actually, uh, you know, we, as far as revenues to the state go, we do have some uh, good news. They're actually, revenues are going to actually increase over the next couple of years. So in the next biennium, we're going to see a, about a $2 billion increase in revenues. So you know, all this talk about how budget cuts and everything else uh, you know, that, that you hear about, there is some good news that revenues are actually going up if we do nothing. So, but uh, again, as far as uh, the taxes go, I, I really think we should work towards uh, trimming the corporate tax rate as well. And one way we could do that is I, I do support uh, Profit Minnesota's uh, effort to to uh, put gambling in uh, machines in some of the uh, in some of the bars rather than a casino, and the reason why I, I prefer that is because it'll keep people in the small towns like St. Joe, and rather than going down to a casino in the cities, it'll it'll help the bars. Uh, you know, the, the the food and beverage industry has just taken a tremendous hit. They've, they've lost uh, you know like 30 percent of their revenues over the last few years, and and I know quite a few of the <laughs> bar owners. And they are hurting, and they have, and it goes right down to where they're laying off people. They're, they can't hire, you know, college students to come in and work at their bars because they just don't have the positions. So what I would like to do with that revenue that we generate from the from the machines in uh, in, in the uh, in the bars would be to, to put it towards a, a cut of corporate tax rate. Well, when, when we start talking about um, you know business climate and taxes, we have to make sure that um, we talk about all taxes, and one of those is property tax. And property taxes have gone up $3.3 billion in the last 10 years. And if you look at the statistics, um, the largest portion of, uh, of businesses' tax liabilities are property taxes. Um, so, so those taxes are already going up in a way that isn't reflective at all of the business activity or the demand that the business is facing. Um, I have a small contracting company in which I do roofing and remodeling. And regardless of the tax rate, it doesn't matter if the demand isn't there. So we need to make sure that this economy and the people in the economy, which is all of us, feel confident enough um, to, spend our, to spend money and that we, we have a, a, a solid foundation for jobs into the future. Um, there's a few things um, that, that I think we need to do to, to really focus on job creation. One is to take a look at our tax credits and deductions that we have in the state of Minnesota. We have a, a, a regular you know, tax, tax um, rate when it comes to income taxes and corporate taxes, but we also have incentives. Um, so if you spend uh, money here or if you spend money there, um, you get certain tax breaks. And we need to make sure that those tax incentives and those tax credits are geared towards job creation and not simply convenience. Um, and we spend millions, hundreds of millions of dollars on different tax credits and deductions that aren't directly attributable or directly connected to jobs. So we need to make sure that we use our limited resources directed towards the best methods that's going to create um, a, a workforce and allow businesses to invest in an area in which uh, is going to create jobs in which they know that that stability is there uh, through the tax system. Uh, but number two is research and development. Um, the state of Minnesota um, has developed um, into a, a hardy business climate with uh, all those Fortune 500 companies that I talked about earlier because of our investment in research and development. Take a look at the Medtronics in the world. Um, take a look at the Best Buys and the Targets and, 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 and all those areas. And it's because we made an investment in research and development that that pacemaker was developed in Minnesota. And we need to make sure that that new technology, um, whether it be in the medical field or biosciences or whatever, is done in Minnesota so our, our businesses, our emerging businesses um, that are coming forward um, feel, for, feel welcome in Minnesota and are hiring individuals. And we've done some things there in which we've done an angel investor tax credit. We've done some biosciences tax credits. Uh, even um, such things as uh, historic renovation, which we've done tax credits that have been directly um, attributable to job growth. Um, that's where we need to focus our efforts. 
Um, and we need to make sure that when we talk about the tax climate, that we include all taxes, not just state taxes, but local property taxes, sales taxes, and all those areas, because they all make an impact on the decisions that businesses have, and, and we don't operate in a vacuum in Minnesota. We need to make sure that, that um, we have a competitive environment throughout the state, state and local. All right, Tom, all one minute. Well, I agree. I mean, we, we <laughs> all taxes are too high, not just uh, not, not just the corporate tax rate and the individual tax rate. We do have to look at all taxes. And uh, it's interesting because, um, you know, if the, if the state raises your taxes, you know, you have you have one or two recourses. You, you, can, you can get rid of Larry or you can get rid of Michelle Fishbach, our state senator. Now, or then, you know, four years down the road, you can get rid of your, uh, try to get rid of the government. But it's, it's actually very difficult to do. But on a countywide basis, if the commissioners are raising your property taxes, you know, you, you can go in there and you, you see that guy down at the grocery store and you say, hey, you know, you, you guys got to stop raising my property taxes or we're not going to vote for you next time. So the closer you can get that tax into the, to the person who's paying the taxes, the easier uh, time you have to, uh, to get rid of those people who are, who are taxing you too high. So uh, I agree. I mean, we've got to examine taxes on every level. It's not just, uh, not just the corporate tax and the, and the income tax. All taxes are too high. So, this goes to uh, Larry in a few minutes. In light of the recent federal health care legislation, how do you view Minnesota's role in terms of implementing or potentially resisting federal, federal health legislation? I'm hoping the candidates can speak particularly about some aspects that affect college students. Well, um, first I just want to make some clarifications when we talk about the federal health care bill. Um, some things like, you know, this is a federal takeover of health care, um, which it absolutely is not. Um, the, the federal health care bill is between a public and private partnership in which uh, your private uh, health insurers are still going to be insuring you uh, today, five years, ten years down the road. Um, there are some components uh, that I think are very important. One of them is uh, making sure that you can still be eligible to be on your parents' health insurance up to the age of 26. In Minnesota, that was something that we've, um, we've worked on. I was actually a co-author of a bill in Minnesota to, uh, to ensure, ensure that um, possibility. When I graduated from college here, um, I, I, I was um, actually uninsured for a while. And, and that is um, gambling. Um, not only with your, your own life, but you're gambling with other people's money. Because if you were to get sick or in a car accident, um, it would cost all of us to care for you if you were uninsured, because you would still get care in an emergency room. Um, other in areas when it comes to health care, though, because I think health care is one of the biggest issues facing our state, because costs are exceeding inflation um, for businesses, for families, and for government. Now, if we don't get a handle on those costs, it's going to eat up all of our resources and our ability to focus our efforts in other areas, such as education. Um, so we need to look at cost, cost containment that focuses on quality of health care, not simply quantity. Right now, the more tests, the more doctor's visits, the more procedures that you have done, um, the more that the medical field um, gets paid for. Um, but it's not linked to the quality of care that you're getting. Um, so we need to move to a system that uses our public, our public dollars um, focused on quality of care. Make sure that the care is, that is ordered and, and, and that you access is based on quality outcomes and not based on quantity and how much you, you get. Um, so those are, are two very important things in the federal health care bill um, that I think moves us towards the right direction. But there are def definitely areas that um, could have um, you know could have been better. Um, but it, I think it was a good first start and especially acknowledges some of the realities that people are facing when it comes to their access to health care. Thank you, Tom. Uh, three minutes. Okay, well, uh, health care, government takeover, see education. It's uh, about the same thing. I, uh, I think the, the, the more the federal government tries to take over health care, the, uh, the worse off Minnesotans are going to be. And the reason is because actually Minnesotans are very lucky. In just about every way that you measure health care, whether it be delivery, cost, or, or uh, uh, quality, Minnesota ranks at or near the top. So what, what, what what I'm, what I'm afraid of is the, the more the government takes over health care is, is what's going to happen. You know, you've got Minnesota up here and you've got 49 states down here. Now, with the government taking over health care, are the other 49 states going to rise up to Minnesota's level of health care? Or is Minnesota going to drop down to some kind of, uh, you know, in, uh, some kind of place in the middle where, you know, you get okay care, but, uh, you know, you, you, you can probably, it's not like it used to be. And, that, and that's what scares me because, you know, actually I have a, a very good friend of mine 
who just uh, uh, discovered he had about three months ago that he had uh, cancer. And you know what? He talked to a lot of doctors, and the doctors told him that the person, the doctor that handles this type of cancer, the best doctor for this is in Rochester. It might, it's the best doctor in the United States, might be the best doctor in the world, is down in Rochester. Well, so he had that option, and he did. He, he's going down to Rochester to receive treatments for his cancer. Now, five to ten years from now, God forbid me or, or my fam someone a member of my family has that same situation, am I going to have that same option? Am I going to have that option to, uh, to send my son to, uh, to Rochester or go to Rochester myself? And believe me, that those are the choices that are going to be made that the federal government is going to be making for you. So I, 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 I view it just a little bit differently. I, I, again, like I said, go to the education. What I'd rather see the federal government doing is give us a block grant to some of that money you don't return to us. We pay. I think we get about 73% of our money back that we pay into the federal government. Well, give us some of that money back and let us decide what's the best way for us to use that money in Minnesota. Because, you know what, we've got the best health care system now, and let us take advantage of it. We, I think we know a little bit better uh, how to use that money than, than the federal government does. Now, as far as, uh, you know, doing it at, at, for, for the students, you know, uh, I, I think the, the way most policies are now is you're a student, I think you, you remain on your, on your parents' health care, at least my, my kids remain on my, my health care. As long as they're a student, all of a sudden, you know, they're done with uh, school. Is there going to be a year or two where there's going to be some, you know, there might be some problems? It, definitely there will be. I know it might be tough to find a job. It might be tough to, uh, to uh, you know, to, to have that uh, health care, but, uh, you know, I think if, if it's something that's needed in the private sector, the private sector will, will supply it. If not, uh, it, it will be supplied. People won't go without health care. They just, they'll just go without health insurance. So. Thank you. There you go. One minute. Well, well first, I, I can't stress this enough. The, the, the bill is not a federal takeover of health care. Um, we might remember the discussion of the public option. There's not even a public option in the federal health bill. Um, this, this federal health, health bill is going to be going using current insurers right now to this day. Um, secondly, um, I do agree we have the best health care system in the world, but we have the best health care system in the world if you have access to it and you can afford it. But if you're the 10% in Minnesota or the 25% in Texas, it is not the best health care system in the world. Right now, your health policy in Minnesota is something that costs $1,200 more because of the uncompensated care provided to people that don't have health insurance today. Businesses, you, your families, the government is paying $1,200 more per policy because people that don't have access to health care are showing up in the emergency room in which is the most expensive, least efficient way of delivering medical care. Um, and, and health insurance is dramatically important because it's not just making sure you have access to emergency care, but you also have health care in which you can maintain your health conditions and make sure that you do it in an affordable way um, that is fair and, in my opinion, moral. Okay. All right. At this time, I think a uh, few more questions. But I hope you all have some questions. So if we could get our volunteers, the microphone folks, um, and uh, let's see some hands out there. We'll, uh, we'll try to mix it up. Uh, so we'll just give the microphone to your friends. And, uh, mix it up a little bit. Be fair. Uh, <laughs> Uh, right and here. what we're going to do is, um, if the candidates want to respond to the question, they'll have two minutes. If you choose not to respond or it's not related, then we'll move on to the next question. Um, can we have I a question? A question you can definitely okay. direct a question. Um, Tom, I was wondering if we can just stay on the topic of healthcare, and could you respond to what uh, Representative Hash just said about how it's not the government to take over healthcare? Because clearly there's some. About that. Well, I guess it all depends on what you, what you consider a takeover. I mean, if, if, if you see uh, large corporations saying that they're going to drop their private coverage for their, for their employees, and then uh, the employees are going to have to get on some type of uh, program that the government is going to be in charge of, well, I would say that uh, that, that is going to be what happened. You know, that's, that's going to be taking over the, uh, the health insurance of the, of the citizens of Minnesota. And it's just, you know, it, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be cheaper to pay a fine to the federal government than to 
than to provide health care for your employees. So, and that's what's going to happen. I mean, these, uh, these companies are going to look at the bottom line, and, and they, they're talking about it continuously. They look at the bottom line, they say, hey, it's cheaper for us to pay a fine to the federal government and let them take care of, uh, you know, put, putting these people in, uh, in some kind of health insurance program. So, uh, I just, uh, I, I just, in Minnesota, I think there's there's some difficulties, but we don't need to throw everything out and start over. I think, uh, and actually, when, when you look at the, the federal government, when they looked at health care, they actually looked at Minnesota and the way Minnesota uh, does things, and that's why they were offering them some of these uh, options to opt in early on, on some of these different things, because Minnesota already does it so well. So they, the federal government was actually looking at how Minnesota takes uh, does their health care. And the other thing is, is that you know you look at an institution like the St. Cloud Hospital, and they are a nonprofit. Well, they're a nonprofit because they provide these services, and it's not just emergency care services. They have probably 15 different services that they provide for free or at reduced cost for the uh, for the citizens of the region. And what happens is that instead of paying the you know the millions of dollars in taxes to the state, they provide these services for free and then have a, have a, a tax exempt status. So. Uh, that system, like I said, that's not just emergency care. They have about 15 different programs that they offer uh, at, at uh, lower reduced costs, or uh, free or reduced costs. Did you want to respond to that? Well, yeah, yeah, quickly. Um, first, uh, we talked about the St. Cloud Hospital, and the St. Cloud Hospital is a member of the Catholic Hospital Association, which supported the reforms. Um, secondly, um, the Rochester Mail, which was used as an example, which is one of the best one of the best um, hospital and clinic systems in the world support the health care reform. Um, what it uses is, 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 is no way a government takeover the exchanges that are put into the bill. It's a marketplace it's in which private health com insurance companies go into the exchanges, offer their services into a large marketplace. It's kind of like the Walmart model. Um, the more people that you have access to, the more purchasing power that you have, the better affordability that you're going to be able to provide them. And that's what the exchanges are. And it's only open to private insurance companies. It's not, there's not a government-run program anywhere in the mix. Um, so I think it's, it's uh, I, I think a lot of it is the political rhetoric. If you can cite to me specific examples or portions of the bill in which you can specifically say is a government takeover, I'm willing to listen more to that. But if you if you look at the legislation um, without a partisan lens, um, it, it, it is in no way a takeover. Just a quick, if, if the, uh, uh, we're going to go to the question. Okay. okay. Um, I, right here. Thank you. Uh, this is another question for Mr. Ellen Becker. I was curious, you mentioned in about two years we can start to see increased revenue under the way things currently are. Well, what do we do until then? For example, I guess, what, what, do, what would you cut to balance the budget? Well, what I have to talk about, see, we work on a, on a biennium basis, so and then it's on a fiscal year basis. so. When I would, if I'm elected and I go into office, we'll be talking about the uh, the next two fiscal years. That's what the budget will cover. So, uh, and that's where the that's where the revenue projections are for those two years going forward. So the budget has already been set up until uh, I think the end of July of next uh, 2011, and then we'll be working on the next two years. So where would I cut? Well, you know, cuts really aren't, aren't really necessary. There's there's a few things that we can do. With the increased revenues, uh, you know, if, if, if you just froze spending at, at this biennium's rate, you could uh, you could take the two billion dollars in increases, and then uh, they're they're projecting uh, that if we did a one more one-time uh, shift in in uh, K through 12 spending, that that would be another two billion dollars that we that we would uh, be saving. So uh, basically, what you can do is you, you you keep the spending at the levels that we are in this in this biennium. And then you've got four billion dollars to work with. To uh, you know, if you want to increase education a little bit, or if you want to, if we have to take care of some of those uh, some of those health and human services increases, we, we've got four billion dollars to do that. But I, I think we have to start with the uh, with the idea that you know, hey, the people in the private sector are not going with these huge <clears throat> uh, huge percentage increases that the federal government wants to, or the uh, state government wants to do. You know, we, we, the, the individuals have cut back. We've uh, you know we, we We've uh, slimmed down, we've trimmed down, we've, we've, we've been able to do that. I think, uh, you know, starting with, uh, uh, you know, at a minimum of starting with the budget where it's at this biennium and hopefully going to a zero-based budgeting where we actually examine everything back to zero and make sure that the spending that, uh, that we're doing now is, is needed and, and uh, is, is a good idea. <clears throat> well, well, first I want to say, 
um, we, we definitely budget in two year biennials. And in 2008, 2009, our budget was $33.8 billion. Um, today, in this biennium, we're down to $31.1 billion. So our budget has already gone down in real dollars by 7.9%. Uh, we are projected to have a $5.8 billion deficit. Even though revenues are growing, it's still going to require cuts because what we've done is we've relied on one-time dollars, $1.4 billion of education shifts, FMAP money, in which we're supporting a $31.1 billion budget on revenues of only $27 billion. So even with that, um, that growth of revenues, we are still going to be required to make cuts and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And these cuts are real. Um, we have an aging population in Minnesota. We are going to have more people who are retired in the year 2020 than we have students in the K-12 education system. 76% of people in our nursing home today are on state paid medical assistance. 51% of people in an assisted living facility are on state paid medical assistance. And our costs are going up not because we're increasing eligibility or making benefits more generous, it's because we're an aging, we're an aging state. And our people with disabilities are having um, more severe disabilities and are living longer with those disabilities because we're not institutionalizing them like we did 30 years ago. So these costs are real. These cuts are real and personal. Um, I've made those cuts. That budget has gone down from $33.8 billion to $31.1 billion. Those cuts were difficult. Um, the solutions that we have in front of us are going to require more cuts. Um, you can't tax yourself out of this. Um, so it's going to require a balanced approach. Um, my, my experience um, in, in the health and human services area, which has the fastest increases in cost, I think will um, lend the state well in being able to make tough, difficult, but targeted de decisions that are going to impact people the least, um, but still make sure that we have a foundation which we can build ourselves upon when our economy gets better. Thank you. Uh, we must have a couple more questions out oh, there. Where's the microphone back there? Um, uh, my question is going back to healthcare. With uh, um, there's a provision in the bill that requires banning uh, people uh, denying people insurance due to pre-existing conditions. Uh, do you support this provision uh, within the bill, or should if healthcare is repealed, should that should some other proposals, if any, be such as that be on the table? Well. Oh, I'm going to do it. Yeah, this is for both of you. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, well, I, I think everybody um, wants to make sure that people aren't denied health insurance for pre-existing condition. I'll give you one constituent um, um, issue in which there's a 22-year-old female who just graduated college um, in my district, um, had diabetes. Um, she got a job. Um, she was making $99 um, too much to be eligible for Minnesota care. Um, but no insurance company would cover her because of a pre-existing condition. And the other option through MSHA was way, way too expensive. Um, so I think everybody wants to make sure that people with, with no responsibility of their own that have a pre-existing condition shouldn't be denied coverage. Now this is where the personal mandate comes into place though, because you cannot have a provision that, 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 that makes sure companies can't deny you for coverage without having a personal mandate. Because if you knew you were eligible for health insurance, regardless of your health status, um, you could just wait, you could be uninsured and just wait until you get sick and then move into the insurance marketplace. And that would make it much too expensive and much um, too unaffordable because you'd only have sick people in that pool um, in, the health, in the health insurance area. So that's where the individual mandate comes from. And that's where we need to make sure that we have affordability measures that are linked to your income. So if you have to have access to health care, that is affordable and that is linked to your income. And that's what the bill does. I absolutely support making sure that nobody is denied health care for any pre-existing condition that they have that is of no choosing or no doing of their own. Well, yeah, first of all, the way economics works is that if the insurance, if it's private insurance companies are taking care of everybody and they don't make money, private insurance companies are going to go out of business. So first and foremost, the insurance companies have to make money. I mean, that's just the economics of it. If they're not going to make money, all they're going to do is they're going to sell car insurance. They're not going to sell health insurance. So first of all, that, that's the first thing that you have to realize is that insurance companies have to make a profit. Everybody thinks that's a bad word, but it's not. It's, it's, it's what drives our economy, and it's what uh, is going to drive health care. There has to be a profit motive involved. So if, in, 
insurance companies lose money because they have to take people with pre-existing uh, conditions, what's going to happen? The, the way it works now is that the insurance companies do deny it. But now, so what's what's the solution? Well, the solution is not having the federal government get involved. I think the state government is very capable of taking care of people with, uh, with pre-existing conditions. We can make modifications to Minnesota care. And like I said, what, uh, if, if the federal government would just give us some of our money back, we would be able to take care of this stuff and we'd be able to have a, have a high risk pool with a, uh, with, uh, you know, a high deductible and that people would, uh, you know, that would be affordable to people. You know, let's say you had something with about a $20,000 deductible per year. And uh, you know the, the cost for a, for an individual individual wouldn't be that high, but then what you do is then this, then Minnesota Care only has to pick up that gap from zero to twenty thousand, and that that would make much more sense than than turning this all over to the to the federal government. So uh, I just I think we can find the solutions in Minnesota. We don't have to we don't have to do it on a federal level. Thank you. Uh, hand back there. Over here too. Um, for both candidates. Um, what is what are your policies and goals for green energy, green jobs, and overall environmental um, initiatives for your career? Well, I'll go first on this one, and it's uh, it, it's one where I get myself in a lot of trouble with uh, with my with my cohorts in the Republican Party because uh, I uh, like I had mentioned in my opening remarks, I am uh, I, I am involved in wind energy. And you know, I my feeling is that any barrel of oil that we save is uh, one that we aren't uh, sending dollars overseas for is is, is great. Now, am I a big uh, cap and trade guy? No, I don't think cap and trade is necessary to get this through. Am I, you know, am I a big uh, national renewable electricity standard guy? No, I don't think uh, we need to be setting a, a renewable electricity standard for the whole country uh, on a, again on a federal level. You know, if, if the states want to do it individually for each state, uh, Minnesota has, I think. Uh, 25% uh, by the year 2025, and that's something that uh, that the people support. Well, then you know that's that's what's needed. We, we don't need the federal government to be setting those standards for us. Cap and trade would be a, a, another one. Terrible idea. I mean, it's going to just uh, burden uh, burden the, uh, the the people who you know purchase their utilities from the electrical companies and everybody else. I mean, it's just going to put a terrible tax on on utilities. So I say, hey, the private set the private sector is getting to the point right now where the amount of money that uh, they receive back in, in incentives through, uh, through, the, uh, uh, through tax, tax incentives is just about to the point where it's, it's a break-even proposition, where the amount of taxes that they pay uh, in, in, to, the, to the federal government in, uh, you know, in, in, during the construction periods and then once the, uh, once the wind farms are up and running, the, it, it comes out to about a break-even proposition. And as a Republican, I have no problem with that. I say, hey, if that wind farm wasn't there, you know, the government wouldn't be receiving these tax, these tax uh, uh, receipts. And you know what? If the wind farm is there, and uh, because of this, the, the wind farm get a little bit money, uh, the money back that's that's about even with how much they pay in taxes. I, I see, uh, I see that's great. And like I said, that's I run into a little bit of problems with my Republican friends when I talk like that. But hey, again, you know, any 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 amount of uh, oil that we can save is is, is uh, money in the bank for us. So. Did you want to respond to that? Well, I think um, I, I was a supporter of the renewable energy standard, which um, I think created that marketplace that allowed for the break-even um, abilities that um, was just discussed, because it allowed for the economies of scale to come into into place. Um, it, it created a marketplace in which there was in which there was stability and and, and predictability. Um, so that was one area, and I think everybody can say that's been a success in Minnesota, especially in rural Minnesota, in which we allow local individual ownership of many of the, these wind farms. Um, but number two, um, and I want to get back to higher education and research and development, and an area that I think can revitalize rural Minnesota to provide jobs, is to look into um, new forms of, of ethanol production. Right now, Minnesota is one of the leaders when it comes to ethanol, but it's um, based on a food source and with our corn production. Um, but if we move to cellulosic ethanol, um, which is something that um, our institutions, the University of Minnesota, the Extension Services, our research um, um, universities can play a leading role in, can create, um, can create a marketplace in which our farmers today can have on, on their regular lands a food, a food crop, while on their marginal lands can have um, um, uh, switchgrass, those type of 
of those type of plants that are able to prevent erosion and still be used when used for ethanol production. I think that is a huge opportunity, and that's something that we should invest in um, because the technology is there, uh, but we have to become more efficient and we have to make it uh, more cost effective. And that's an area that I think is going to be extremely beneficial for rural Minnesota. That's an area that can provide jobs, and that's an area that's going to reduce our dependence on oil and make sure that we're focusing on, on bringing energy sources that are, are, are made here at home. My question is for Tom. Um, earlier you talked about opening up uh, slot machines and putting them off like in the town and stuff. Well, I, I'm going to vote in this district, but back home I live five miles away from a Native American reservation. I have many friends that I went to school with and grew up with who depend on you know, the casino there. How can I go home and justify to my friends to vote for you who supports gambling off Native American reservations, which may have turned out that? Well, I think uh, actually both candidates could address this. Yeah, and my, yeah, there's another. Well, first, first of all, it was uh, we both have the same well, same polling on this question. So, sorry. Good. So, no matter uh, who, who you vote for, you're going to vote for someone who supports it. It's, it's one of the things that how can I get. how can I justify it? You know, how well, I guess it's it's just a matter of uh, you know, do you want to have a, a monopoly or, uh, that just services the people down in your area, or, or do you want to have do you want to open it up for? Uh, for everybody in the in, in the state, and I just think it's uh, and again, it wouldn't be really slot machine, but what they're talking about is electronic pull tabs and electronic bing, electronic bingo, are, are the main are the main machines that they're looking at. So they're not looking at putting uh, slot machines in all the bars. So, but the other benefit of this too is that uh, uh, one of the areas again here, the Catholic Church and, and many other organizations, they they uh, depend on uh, uh, this gambling. Uh, Pull tab money uh, for for their services, and again, it's just been a terrible, terrible thing. The, the VFWs, the American Legions, all these people who do all these great things, you know, for, for our cities and for our regions, they uh, they're hurting really bad because of the uh, you know the, the loss of revenue from the from the pull tabs. Now, the reason why the electronic stuff was, is talked about is because of you guys. Now, you guys don't go into a bar and open pull tab, but I tell you what, you go play video games. So you start putting the video stuff in, in bars, I think you guys would be a little bit more uh, apt to uh, partake in it. So is it something that we want people addicted to? No, we don't want them addicted to it. It's like anything else, you know, anything in moderation is great. But the benefit to the local, uh, the local community, the benefit to the state, and uh, the benefit to jobs, and again, putting some of that state money towards the corporations, I think it's about a win-win-win for everybody involved. So uh, again, that's, that's where I support it. Yeah, Jim, there, uh, two minutes on the well, well, first, um, when I was in college, if I was going into a bar, I wasn't going to be spending on gambling. I was going to be buying drinks, and because uh, I didn't have much of it, uh, I wanted to have my drinks. But uh, you know, the, the, this is a tough decision. I mean, the, the decisions we have before us are between bad and worst. Um, there's no easy decision when we have a 5.8 million dollar deficit. Do I want to build a casino every time we have a deficit? Absolutely not. Um, is it my first choice? Absolutely not. Um, but do we need to consider um, gambling revenues as a source to, to our solution for our budget deficit? I think we need to. Uh, part of it can be whether um, we try to renegotiate our agreements um, with um, the sovereign nations. Um, because what happened is when Minnesota authorized the, the, the lottery in 1988, that opened up the ability for, for sovereign nations to have casinos. We were the first state that negotiated an agreement. And we had a no-compete clause. The agreement was in perpetuity. Um, there was no um, uh, payments in lieu of taxes or anything of that sort. When you look at Iowa and Wisconsin, neighboring states, they have a better deal in which there's a, a partnership between the tribes and the state. And we need to either try to renegotiate that, those agreements, or we have to consider other forms as a revenue. And is it ideal? No, it's not. But um, it's something that I would um, support. It's better than the alternatives that we have in front of us. If it means cutting people that um, need certain services, making education more expensive because we can't make uh, the state commitments that we have or any of those, those things. So um, I, I, I'm going to be front, out front with you and probably disagree with your sentiments. I understand where you're coming from, but uh, you know, I hope you, you respect and understand that the decisions we have are between bad and worse. I think we'll take uh, uh, one more question. Uh, maybe two more. Okay, two more questions, and we'll go for closing statements. 
candidates may be able to stick around a little bit. There's some literature over here. I'm not sure what your schedule is, but uh, I promise your time if you don't have it here. Definitely stay around there. I serve a few more beers. So. Uh, this you, one's, oh, where are we at? Okay. Are we? Okay. This is for both candidates. We've seen in the last couple of years a huge divide amongst parties, parties bickering between each other and only voting for what their party wants. Uh, will each of you work across the aisle to create a better solution for Minnesota in the years to come if that situation is Well, you know, it's uh, my feeling is that the, the best government is the government that governs the least. And, uh, you know, I, we, we, all we hear about is all the problems and, and all the bickering and everything else. But you know what? If, 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 as long as we get the budget taken care of and, and we provide the services that the state needs to provide, you know, I, as long as we come to that, uh, you know, come to that end, I, I, the bickering and everything really doesn't bother me. But uh, you know, as far as reaching across the aisle, you know, it's uh, it's tough. If, if you're in the minority, you know, the, the majority basically controls everything. And so, if if, uh, if Mark Mark Dayton uh, is elected governor and uh, and, uh, and the Democrats maintain control of the House and the Senate, well, you know what? I, I, if I'm elected, I'm not going to be in a very good position to, uh, to to be able to bargain with anybody, you know, because they they, they don't even have to li listen to me as as a, as a matter of course. So. You know, uh, as far, what I would like to see is I would like to see the, the, the state government get back to just providing the, the services and, uh, you know, that, that, that's required by the state constitution and that we just, uh, you know, watch our, watch our numbers, watch our budget, you know, we, we can, uh, you know, we can, we'll, we'll compromise on, on how to get there, but you know what, there, as, as long as, as long as we get, get to the end, uh, we're, where everybody is, uh, you know, has taken part in the process. Control that are, are gonna are gonna write the laws anyway. So uh, I guess, you know, it's, it's, if, if I'm if I'm going, I'm gonna fight for what I what I believe in. But uh, you know, like I said, if I go in with a with a minority, it's gonna be tough. If I go in with the majority, it's gonna be just the opposite. Well, then what you'll see is you'll see the uh, the uh, the less taxes, the the uh, you know that that drive is gonna go through, and and then the uh, the. You know, people thinking that we don't, we aren't paying enough taxes. Well, you know what? They're going to be the ones who are going to be saying we're we're not compromising. So I won't promise anything <laughs> as far as compromising. Well, but I, I think um, you know, a, a, as an elected official, you represent everybody um, in your district: uh, Republicans, Democrats, Independents alike. And you don't get to choose the circumstances in which you get to serve. Uh, the, the the six years that I've been serving in the legislature, I've been serving with Governor Plenty. In my first uh, two years, I was in the minority, and I believe I was able to represent um, um, the citizens of 14B well, whether I was in the minority or the majority, and with a governor that oftentimes I disagreed with, um, but that I had to work with, because that was my responsibility. The checks and balances that are, were developed in our Constitution um, requires us to work amongst each other, not against each other. Um, so sometimes I am absolutely uh, frustrated um, with the partisanship that is going on. Um, and, and that is something that I try not to partake in. Um, I am going to argue my position, and I'm going to make the best case for what I think is the right thing to do. Um, but at the end of the day, that I know I have a responsibility to find solutions for the state. And those solutions have to um, try to represent everyone, those that voted for me and those who didn't vote for me, because I still represent them. And I think if you look at those who have supported me, um, that I've been able to show a, a, a large bipartisan opinion. I'm endorsed by the Farmers Bureau and the Farmers Union. I'm the only legislator in this entire St. Cloud area that is endorsed by both of those organizations. I'm endorsed by the NRA. I'm endorsed by the MCCL, which is the pro-life organization in Minnesota. I'm endorsed by the Minnesota Medical Association and the Minnesota Hospital Association, which oftentimes may have a, um, a little more conservative um, bent. Uh, but they know that I'm willing to work and look at different ideas and consider all options on the table. Um, that is the way that I've worked in the last six years. Um, I promise you that's the way I'm going to work in the next two years, regardless of who gets elected, regardless who's our governor, regardless if I'm the minority or the majority. Um, because I still represent you, and um, I'm, I'm still going to do my best um, to make sure that um, we look for solutions and that we work amongst each other, not against each other. Okay, we'll take a You've been waiting up here. So, last question. Questions? Sorry.
This question is for uh, you, Representative Hosh. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more uh, when it comes to healthcare and you said we need both quality, not quantity? So I feel like you can be left up to interpretation that our physicians and nurses and medical technicians are not providing the best quality that they can, like fill it or something like that. So, can you elaborate? Yeah, well, first, I absolutely believe that our, our nurses, our, our uh, doctors, are trying to provide the best quality of care. But sometimes our system doesn't. Um, doesn't have, um, doesn't pay for um, the way to deliver the best quality of care. And I'll give you an example. St. Mary's Duluth Clinic had a pilot program for people with um, diabetes and congestive heart failure. Um, we, 80 percent of our healthcare costs are borne by people with six different chronic conditions. Two of them are, are diabetes and congestive heart failure. Um, what they did with this um, cohort was they sent them home. They had a monitoring device that did blood pressure, weight, um, different vitals. And it reported back to the clinic um, to a nurse that monitored their, their vitals every single day. And if something was out of whack, they'd call and say, what's going on? Have you changed your diet? Um, why are you losing weight or whatever? They reduced hospital admissions among that group by 80%. But they lost money because they get paid when they go into the hospital. So that's what I'm talking about, paying for quality, in which we have a flexible system in which allows for reimbursement of those innovative type of programs. <laughs> Um, that produce better quality, better outcome, and isn't solely focused on quantity of care. How many times you show up in the emergency room? How many times you're admitted to the hospital? How many referrals you have to specialists or how many surgeries that you have? And the Mayo Clinic is one that is a perfect example. The doctors don't contract this Mayo Clinic. They are on a salary. No matter what kind of care, no matter how many referrals, no matter how many patients they visit, they get the same amount of money. So right now, if you're a primary care physician, you have to visit about six to seven people in an hour just to be able to make money, pay the receptions, pay your nurses, pay the rent. And that doesn't necessarily equate to quality. And that primary care physician wants quality of care, but the system that has created it only allows them to be with their patient for five minutes at a time or seven minutes or anything like that. That's what I mean by paying for quality and not just quality. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, real quickly, uh, you know, but we also have to make sure that uh, that the intended results, you know, are, are what are what happen. You know, I I, I I'm on a uh, the board of directors of a nonprofit, St. Cloud. It's uh, Independent Lifestyles, and what Independent Lifestyles is, it's a uh, it's a nonprofit that helps uh, people with disabilities with living skills. So hopefully, what they can do is they can go out and live on their own. And you know, at the end of the year, we can actually look at, uh, at all the consumers that we serve and we can see how much money we save the county. So we save the county hundreds of thousands of dollars. We can actually document that that's what we're saving the county through this program. And I think our, you know, we have to, we have to use that uh, in our uh, health and human services budget as well. You know, we have programs like uh, SHIP. SHIP was a program that they, that they spent $47 million on last biennium to help people stop smoking and uh, lose weight. Now, is that a great idea? Yes. You know, the state will save money if people uh, weigh less and don't smoke. But we spent $47 million on it. Did anybody quit smoking? And did anybody lose weight? I mean, there's got to be a way to measure this stuff to make sure that, uh, you know, the $47 million was well spent. Now, if they can show that, uh, you know, that, that after a couple of, you know, uh, bienniums, after four years, that this money is well spent and saving the state, uh, and saving the state all this money because people, uh, their health care uh, costs are going down, well, that's great. You know, then I would certainly support it. But if they come up and they want another $47 million and they can't say what that money, you know, if that money is actually helping anybody, well, I say no. I say, well, then, you know, you guys haven't proven that uh, that $47 million was well spent. You know, it's a great idea, but uh, we got to look at these programs. We have to we have to figure this into what we're doing. So that kind of ties into the whole, uh, you know, the zero-based budgeting and uh, making sure that uh, we're getting results for the money that we're spending. <coughs> Time for two minute closing statements, and then as I mentioned, we'll feel free to hang out, take your bartender as well, and uh, there's some more pizza. So, uh, this we'll have Larry go first, and Tom will close. Well, it's been an absolute honor to, to represent the two best institutions in the state St. John's and St. Ben's. Um, St. John's and St. Ben's made me who I am today, it's what brought me to St. Joseph in the first place, it's what's made St. Joe my home. Uh, maybe want to raise my family. Um, but I'm not asking you for your vote today. I want to earn your vote. Um, I want to make sure that if you have questions, if you have concerns. You're buying beer. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, 
if, if you want to challenge me on my position, that you feel free to do so. I can't always promise you I'm going to agree with you 100%. I can't always promise you a certain result, but I can promise you I'm going to do my best to listen to you and try to answer your questions. Um, all my literature has my personal cell phone number on it, has my email on it, and it's, it's not an office with a faceless person answering my phone. It's the phone right here. Please utilize that. Um, please ask me questions. Um, please make sure that you feel um, that um, I am accessible um, to representing your views. And, and I, I hope that um, with, with that dialogue, whether it be now and up to the election or even afterwards, that I can earn your vote and not simply ask for your vote. Um, this has been uh, one of the, the best learning opportunities that I've ever had. I am humbled every time that I walk up the steps of the Capitol. And I, I see the awesome responsibility that has been given to me. Um, the history before me, the state that we built, that we built together, in which those that we stand on their shoulders, uh, it, it is something that is an awesome responsibility. We need to make sure for the next generation that we're not standing on their shoulders, they're standing on our shoulders. And that's the type of attitude that I want to bring down to the Capitol. Um, I, I, I have been nothing but honored to represent you. I love coming back here. Um, it feels like I was just here yesterday. Um, as a student, and um, you are at a special place. Enjoy your four years here. Take every opportunity um, to get to know your classmates and to make friends with them, because these four years are gonna make you who you are into the years ahead. Yeah, I'd also like to thank, uh, you know, again, the McCarthy Center for having this. has just been a great forum, and it's, uh, you know, Young people, uh, you know, sometimes even the city of St. Joe, I live uh, on 6th Avenue Northwest, so a lot of you guys, you know, a lot of the students come down and party, you know, they never bother me, but the, the students a lot of times get a bad, the students a lot of times get a bad rap, and you know what, uh, it, it, it's it's not deserved. You look at St. Cloud State, it's funny, they had like 300 arrests at homecoming, and what, 50 of them were St. Cloud State students, so, you know, the students get this bad rap, and, and again, uh, you know, I, I was a Johnny, and, or I am a Johnny, and I, I participated in, in all the, the things that everybody participates at St. John's, and, and uh, like I said, the students the students will get a bad rap uh, that's, that's certainly not deserved. And also, uh, you know, you know, at, at the end of the day, I hope uh, you know when we talk about bipartisan and getting along and everything, I just uh, my feeling is that at the end of the day, I hope we uh, we have a mutual respect for each other, and that's 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 what I want to see. You know, that that we can uh, you know after we have a forum, we can go over at the bar and we can have a have a beer together. You know, we have our disagreements, uh, but I think all of us have the what's best for the state as, uh, you know, as, 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 our, as our hope, because, uh, you know, we all love it here, we all love it in Minnesota, you know. Uh, I'm not gonna move, move away and take my businesses and go somewhere else. I'd rather work at it from the inside and make it uh, more, you know, more uh, better for my business rather than uh, threatening to move, because it's, it's, cause it's, the life in Minnesota is just fantastic. So again, if you're just experiencing central Minnesota for the first time, you know, that if you're a freshman or you've gone here for a couple of years, like Larry said, take advantage of it. It's the greatest place to live. Uh, I've lived in St. Joe for 18 years, and I wouldn't live anywhere else. So, and again, uh, I just uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, uh, like I said, Larry's buying the beer. So, <laughs> well, yeah, it was legal. Like, it's not legal. So. <laughs> well, let's give a big round of applause.